So let me welcome you to my session, DevOps for Startups. Like in recent, and sorry for the name, it's uh, always hard to pronounce for non-native speakers. Um, where am I? I am Dativ's principal cloud platform engineer responsible for Dativ's cloud platform. I've been a developer for five to six years working on Java applications. I've been a, a admin working on legacy admin systems, if you want to mainframe, Java enterprise service, and I'm doing cloud platform business for almost seven years now. Let me first tell you who Dativ really is. We had the discussion yesterday evening, and you might see Dativ's logo on your paychecks every month. Dativ is actually a cooperative. It's not a company with shareholders. It's a cooperative for tax consultants, and you can't buy Dativ software in stores. You simply can get it through your tax consultant. Uh, also, it's one of the largest software companies in Europe with a, almost 60 years of history. Bit of a numbers just to show you what we're talking about. We're talking about 8,500 uh, employees and really a lot of developers. And that's why we think DevOps is not the way we want to work with our IT and our platform infrastructure. But let me take you on a journey on a, a simple application. Let's say we have that idea of a groundbreaking application, totally new, totally fancy, and we have to create that application, and it suddenly gets successful. What do we have to do? So first of all, well, I don't want to go into the war between Eclipse and IntelliJ. I like both. Um, just choose your tools, start coding, and create the application. So deploy it on a server, at a database, and you're done. At least my home projects are done in that case. And what happens to such an application? Well, it sometimes doesn't work because your single server machine is just in maintenance mode, for example. So OK, if it's a business critical application that is successful, it has to be available. So what do we want to do? Let's add a Kubernetes cluster to that application. We have that application running on a Kubernetes cluster, and they choose a high available cluster with at least three master nodes and three worker nodes. In that case, put the app on it, put the database on it, and well, it requires to re-architect the application to work in that high available mode. It requires containerization, working with Kubernetes, how to create containers, and all the Kubernetes configuration as well. And what happens next? Well, the application doesn't perform like it should be. OK, I put the database and the application on the same Kubernetes cluster. Maybe the machines used for the application are not suitable for the database itself. So OK, sure, I can use a public cloud for that. But for the sake of this experiment, let's do it by hand and add another Kubernetes cluster. Maybe I can use different machine types for these kind of database clusters, which are more compute intensive, whereas standard web applications are more I.O. intensive. Um, but I have to manage all this complexity of a high available database. And database and high availability, especially when it comes to data persistence, is always a bit of a problem or not that easy to manage. Um, and of, obviously, it requires a second Kubernetes cluster in my setup. Oh, it seems to not to work like it should be. Ah, now it works. OK, I have two Kubernetes clusters, and I want to quote a friend of mine, Domain Druids, which was former at VMware. And she said, it's 9 PM. Do you know what your clusters are doing? Well, I don't know what my clusters are doing. They're just running, and I hope they are doing what they expect. So I would start with uh, monitoring. Let's say a next Kubernetes cluster. Let's say we had monitoring capabilities. We have to set up monitoring observability to see what my applications are really doing. This requires additional knowledge. Knowledge in operating Grafana, Prometheus, for example, requires knowledge in gathering all the metrics, requires knowledge in creating dashboards around that metric, connecting to emergency systems, alarming, and maybe also requires knowledge of log management, because logs have to be kept somewhere, have to be kept to legal reasons. Some logs you can't use, can't keep all the time. You have to comply to legal reasons, for example. And that's why you have to set up all these new clusters with all monitoring features. OK, we have monitoring, we have database, application clusters. 
how do we manage all this stuff? We want to get into this continuous delivery mode, so obviously we need some sort of pipeline tooling, CICD tooling, Git workflows. Doesn't matter which tool you choose for your CICD tooling, it's still some sort of pipelining tool which you need to. This enables us to deliver the application at any time, to do updates, zero downtime upgrades, but it requires additional coding in the application. It requires good unit integration tests to be able to run the pipeline anytime. It requires rolling deployments to be able to deploy without any downtime and without affecting the customer's usage of the application. It obviously requires the maintenance of that build system as a whole, and it requires knowledge and all that CI CD tooling and workflows. Okay, CVs. Obviously, we have to care about the CVs as well. How do we do this? Well, we can add tooling into the pipeline, into the clusters, CVE scanning, license management, for example. Big deal for enterprises is license management because if you choose the wrong open source license, you have to open source your code as well, which you won't do as an enterprise typically. So license management, license scanning would be an option and requires additional knowledge, all this legal knowledge around open source licenses, um, it requires specific tooling and know-how in these CV scanning tools, and it has additional complexity you have to handle. Okay, uh, next topic would be, what if my service gets attacked, if I have to add stability, like rate limiting, or if I have to want to extract these identity topics, these Login topics, for example, I don't want to have that code in every application. I want to add it in a common gateway, for example. So we, we can add an identity gateway if you want to. This gateway can handle all the authentication, the login processes, but it requires additional knowledge in API design, in API gateway operations, and all the skills in identity management as well. Good, okay, we can have that as well if you want to. We can add several other tools, like hardening tools, like IDPs, intrusion detection, intrusion prevention systems, to all this picture. And again, it requires additional knowledge by the operator how this really works. How can we analyze all the logs that are produced by such systems? How can we react? It requires emergency procedures, and all that stuff again. Okay. I want to have to manage these clusters somehow, and this is probably the last topic I'm talking about. Um, it really gets complex because I have to add a cluster management solution. In this picture, I have five, four, five, six Kubernetes clusters. I have to maintain them, I have to upgrade them, I have to have all the patching, security operations. I want to have them all compliant to the same set of policies, for example, and to achieve this, I have to add a cluster management solution, for example. Um, but it requires me to define all the policies that maintains that common subset of components that can be centralized. Maybe having Flux all over my landscape and want to have that version at the same version in every Kubernetes cluster. And all that requires a lot of effort to do so. And there are really not much more topics to come. So maybe some of these topics are certifications. If you want to have to certify your application because you're dealing with sensitive data, C5 certification. This is just one setup. Maybe you want to go multi-cloud. You want to have global load balancing, or you want to have a staged environment where you have a dev, a QA, and a production stage, you will triple that effort. So what I wanted to do was creating a simple application with a database. And where I ended up was managing five Kubernetes clusters, monitoring systems, CID, CID, CICD systems, sorry, um, two less coffee, um, code scanning, CV scanning systems, dealing with all the processes, and some, so much more to come. And this leads to a, a survey I found on the internet conveyed by Stack Overflow and MongoDB, where it says, um, you spend typically only two days a week creating and innovating new products and code. You spend another two days a week doing infrastructure, maintaining infrastructure, doing patching, and keeping all that stuff alive. 
And well, we all need meetings to a certain degree, the typical spent on meetings is another day of the week. So two or five days a week, you just have time for doing innovation. And how we, we should get back to that motion, uh, that model where we can spend as much time as possible on creating value for the customer, not on maintaining infrastructure and tooling. So how does this scale for an enterprise? If you have that kind of setup and you tell your developers, okay, here is a Kubernetes cluster, do whatever you need, you will end up in this decline of productivity if you want. And imagine scale this to 2,000 developers, it simply doesn't work. So I want to quote Kelsey Hightower in his tweet. It was Twitter at that time. Um, he said, it's quite easy. You just have to roll out your own platform. It doesn't matter if it's on-prem, like it's in our case, or if it's in the public cloud. Just choose some tools from the CNCF landscape. And we saw that in the morning. It's a really huge landscape. And he said, choosing 200 tools and you have your own platform. Well, yeah, it could be that easy, but try that approach. We have this picture of our complex infrastructure. We can say, OK, let's define for all our teams a common subset of pipelines. What are services in a pipeline that can be offered as a product team to all the teams creating value for the customer? Another service is hardened infrastructure. Identify common problems all teams will have and create your infrastructure so that these problems are addressed already. The creation of cluster, for example, is also a topic. So clusters should be created as a self-service. Avoid paper-like processes there. As I said in the database chapter, database as a service is also one thing where you can say, OK, I want to have a team offering databases as a service to other teams. And they can take care of the database high availability stuff and what's all necessary. I can have platform automation to get away of the toil of managing all these distributed Kubernetes clusters. And I can have monitoring as a service as well. So I can just book my monitoring. I don't have to set up my Prometheus Grafana cluster my own, for example. And the last of these probably is can have application templating. It can have template applications where you can click a button as a developer and get your bootstrap application and can start right away because it's pre-configured for your platform landscape for your environment. So if you have that platform or container as a service, you can do it the following way. You can use Kubernetes or any higher level platform instruction what you want to have. We use Kubernetes in Cloud Foundry, for example. You should offer clusters on demand, maybe namespaces on demand, to your developers as a self-service. Just click a button or use an API to provision your namespace or your cluster just on demand. And pre-provision that cluster with everything that's necessary. CSI drivers, storage classes, what works for your environment. Maybe network and compliance policies, maybe network plugins which are necessary. Maybe all the automation capabilities, like creating custom operators for your specific environment. And also think of pre-configuring, log management, monitoring, maybe onboarding, offboarding, or integration into security processes, because you can tailor that Kubernetes cluster to the needs of your team so it fits best your infrastructure. Those, the team doesn't get a simple, plain Kubernetes cluster. It gets a pre-configured, in our case, Dartif Kubernetes cluster. And that's what we do. We create environments for teams, which the teams can provision by a click of a button, by using a GitOps flow, for example. And they get their pre-provisioned environment as close as possible to the Kubernetes native stack, but with all the features they need within our own environment. Obviously, you can do the same with automation. You can say, OK, Automate all that automatically created clusters. Every up uh, update should be zero downtime. When the update to the customer should be zero downtime, the update to the platform itself should also be zero downtime. So treat this platform as your product you sell your to, to your developers. 
ideally, upgrades should be fully automatically because if you don't have to care about all the updates and a robot does it for you or a pipeline does it for you automatically, you have a lot of more time to be creative, to start about thinking about new ways. And this automation does not only involve the Kubernetes cluster itself or the platform itself, it also affects any adjacent processes. It doesn't stop at the boundary of your platform, it goes to your whole infrastructure. And all these processes do have to be automated, no manual processes. And what we do is the example below. It's a screenshot of our concourse pipeline we use as fully automated platform maintenance. If a fix gets published, it will be pulled in our staging or lab environment and two days later in the dev environment. We run a lot of tests like you would do with a standard software rollout. We do this with platforms as well. And it works for us because we mostly don't have to care about all the patches and fixes unless they don't contain any problems or bugs. Same with databases. If you want to do a database as a service, you should have a offering which consists of not all databases you need, but all, one of every kind. A relational database, a document store, a blob store, for example, and all the same with messaging. Have an offering, have a team caring about your messaging infrastructure and your database infrastructure, and let them create their products API-based, self-service-based, with all the things developers should not care about, like pre-configured backup strategies, rollback strategies, with all the day two operations, update strategies, zero downtime upgrades for databases as well, so for example. And also pre-configured logging, monitoring, and everything that's necessary. And again, treat these databases as a product, which involves documentation. We don't like, we all don't like documentation, I know, for especially creating one. Um, but have a good documentation for the product and offer support for your developers. Offer consulting and education and say, okay, here is the product. You can order this product like your database. You can work with it, but I'm here to help you. I'm help, I can help you if you want, you want me to. If you don't want me to help you, you can do it on your own as well. Actually, that's what we do. We created two separate teams, one for messaging. They use Kafka and RabbitMQ or as a service. And the other team is responsible for databases as a service. The database is listed here. And you can book these databases with all the criteria we have here in that case. Same with monitoring. I don't want to set up my monitoring cluster. I don't want to set up my Prometheus and Grafana instance. And I want, don't want to deal with all the regulations like there is personal data in that log stream and I only have to keep it seven days. Um, otherwise, I'm not compliant to legal. So have a team working with these and dealing with all these monitoring issues and offering several monitoring services. And I say what, what we do is we offer metric-based monitoring, Prometheus Grafana, obviously, which is for us the kind of industry standard for monitoring. Again, open telemetry, which is kind of combining all these. Um, but you all, we all have applications that do not offer Prometheus capabilities, and therefore we also offer some agent-based monitoring. You can hook up agent to your application, and it, this agent will collect all the metrics and submit it to your central log management system or your metrics system. Log management, yeah. You have to care about log management as well. As I said, you have to care for retention times and you have to care for data visibility. Who is able to see what? And in that case, you can benefit from a pre-configured logging because in our case, we can have all these logging connected to a security team, a global security team that has the access to all these logs and can detect threats in any application at our company. It's also connected to global alerting and incident process, and it's also a self-service for developers to say, okay, I want to have this metric alerted, and please call me in the middle of the night if there is a problem with this metric. Again, offer it as a self-service. Offer it as consulting and training to this. Hardware infrastructure, yeah. As I said, 
look at your Kubernetes clusters you have and try to think about what you can pre-bake into this infrastructure. You can pre-bake security into this platform. You can disable privileged containers by default, for example. You can add authentication and authorization as a gateway up front, so you don't have to care with these authentications in the application itself. And if you try, ever try to debug all of two flows, they can be challenging. Some of you know what I mean. <laughs> also, again, think of, think of your concepts like, concepts like uh, workload separation, like web application firewalling, for example. If you have a layer 7 gateway up front, you can also do web application firewalling up front. You can do API gateway validation or rate limiting up front. And again, this is the same principle. It's self-services and consulting-based. So your developers should be able to book all these services on a self-service basis. Again, that's what we do, actually. That's how it works. We have a special team responsible for API gateways and API management, and they are responsible for all these uh, authentication flows, like these API gateway definitions. They offer a self-service where I, as a developer, can hand in my API definition, and the gateway gets populated with all that information and with all the necessary security features around. The discussion about pipelining is, well, should the pipeline be part of the platform or should the pipeline be part of the development team? In my opinion, um, the pipeline should be part of the development team, at least the pipeline definition. Those, the pipeline should be managed as code with the platform, with the, as code with the software itself. But the platform you run this application on should offer all the capabilities needed, like there should be a tool for CV scanning, for static code analysis, for code quality tooling, and all that stuff. The reason why I think pipeline code should be part of the application code is because it can easily be changed with the application itself and adjusted to all the needs of the application. But again, there is a necessity of a team managing all these components needed, like the CV scanning and what else. Maybe there are some legal compliance tools, like for us, we have that 4i policy, otherwise the application can't be deployed to a production environment, because it's a legal requirement, which is kind of a problem when you're on call at the middle of the night and you just don't have any other colleague um, approving your commit. But it's a policy and we have to comply to this so we can bake that into the pipelines as well. And the last one, this application templating. As I said, a real good example is this Spring Initializer. If you use Java, you can use start.spring.io for creating bootstrap projects. And the funny thing about this is you can host it your own and you can adjust it to the needs, whatever you need. You have that engine of creating by a single click a application which has all the things you need in your application within. And you can also maintain libraries of good and best practices, what will really work. And what also works great for us, and I remember the keynote tomorrow, transformation is about people, and people need communities, so maintaining communities. With these, like the pipeline example, with these source code scanning tools, the rules for these tools at our company are not made by the owner of the tool, they are made by the community. There is a meeting every two months where the whole developer community can vote on certain rules, which rules should be part of the coding guideline and which rules should not be part. So a community can have a huge impact on your platform and you have to work as a platform team close with the community to create the platform the developers really wanted and needed. So if you remember this, choose your 200 items from the list. Well, I didn't choose 200. But if you have a look at our landscape, we have one pipelining tool, which is Jenkins at our side. It's not the newest one, but it works for us. As I said, we use Kafka and RabbitMQ. We use various databases. We use Postgre, Mongo, Redis, which are the common 
types of databases to use. We, we have a lot of legacy databases as well, like big old mainframes with DB2s and MSS SQL servers and whatever database you want to imagine. Um, you use an object storage, we use Ceph in that case. We have a lot of monitoring capabilities. Um, AppDynamics, Blank, Isinga, I, I actually forgot Grafana and Prometheus on there. Um, and well, how do we manage these platforms? It's Kubernetes, it's Cloud Foundry based. We use a lot of Cloud Foundry applications as, as well. Um, within Kubernetes, we use Flux as keeping all our clusters in sync across all their environment, and we use Concourse for automation. And with that, given this chart from the beginning, we can, well, we cannot reach 95%. We, we still have meetings, and the bigger the company is, the more meetings you will have. But if you have a good documentation and self-services, you can get up to four days a week of being productive and working and creating and innovating. You still have meetings, you still have to care about infrastructure, but if the infrastructure is self-service based, it all can be code and part of your application. And the key to this is treat your platform and all the adjacent things as products. Products you're selling to your developers, and you have to improve to keep that in a state where developers want to use them. And besides all the technology, you have to do a lot more. It's not about only providing the technology, it's about having documentation, it's about one example of the platform office hours we do at our company. Um, be as transparent as possible, have good documentation, have issue tracking. If you have an issue that comes around and it comes around a second time, question yourself, why is that? Is the documentation missing? Is there a tooling not the way it is? And after some time working with this, the issues you will get are not with the platform itself, but with the other surrounding processes. Like all the, let's call it legacy processes you have to work with, you have to deal with. So it's, a, it's basically a matter of mindset. It's, as in the keynote today, change people. It's about culture. It's about changing the culture of an enterprise to a way that developers can work with their own application, can take ownership of their application. And the, there is a lot of fear from this. If you have been a developer, developing your application, throw it over the wall and someone else has to operate it for you. And the culture has to change and you have to empower developers to do so. But that also means to all the managers you have to allow your developers to take that responsibility and to that ownership, that lean management principle that here is your application, take ownership of this and work with this and I trust you to do the right decisions. And by the way, you are the one doing the decision, not I as your manager are doing the decision. As I said, this all requires a lot of automation. And we did a lot of automation with the platform, like our developers did with the applications, because that allows us a lot of uh, capacity and free mind to be able to innovate, to be able to talk to others to see what our customers really need, what my developers really need, and what Dativ's customers need from their applications. Of course, you have to measure this. You have to be able to define the right KPIs to see if that what you change to your application has the desired effect on your customer. And the best thing is, and that's why I'm here, is sharing what you do. Sharing and talking about what you do within your company, within container days like here. Um, just tell what works for you. Don't, don't expect that I, what I just told you did work for you the same way. I bet it won't, but take it as an idea. What can work for you as well? So I hope you get a lot of ideas what can be done and what might work for you as well. So start turning these ideas into reality. Just work on this, on these ideas of creating your own platform, of creating a way where developers, even large enterprises, can be product, uh, productive again. As a summary, I would say start with visualizing what you have. What are your workflows? What are bottlenecks? What are friction points where work is getting slowly? And try to create self-service offerings around. 
if 20 teams have to maintain their own monitoring infrastructure, think about creating one team maintaining this as a service to others. And treat all these as a product. I tr try to say my developers are my customers because customers have the right to choose if they want to use a product or if they won't use a product. So I have the, the urgency to create a good product that my customers really want to use it. If they are just users, they have no choice. They have to use. That's why I always talk about my developers as my customers. And you should talk a lot. Talk with your developers to see what they really, really need and how you can achieve this as a, a whole, as a group. So even in large enterprises with a lot of regulations, and we have more than 2,000 developers, you can work as effective as possible if you have the right platform in place. Keep that in mind. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Jürgen. Um, uh... A fair amount of questions. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think I, I expected this from uh, the title itself. Uh, <laughs> so we'll go with the first one. Uh, hopefully we'll get through a fair few of them. If not, uh, obviously have a chat with Jürgen later, but let's start with the first one. How would you limit typical developer? We need that wild growth in your approach when yeah. everyone can click new cluster. Everyone can click new clusters, but it comes with a price. As in a public cloud, we do charge developers on internal chargeback to say, OK, you need a cluster, but it has an internal price. We have to pay licensing to a vendor, and this and all the energy costs and cooling costs are pinned as a price on that cluster. If the developers want to choose to buy for five clusters, they can do so if they want to. I want to quote a... a Quote from the origin where I came from, it's, it's in German, but I will translate it afterwards. Uh, it says, wenn's nix kost, dann taugt's nix. Um, which means, if it doesn't have a price, it's not valuable. So everyone and every part of your platform has to have some price tag on it. And that's how at least it works for us. Cool. Um, how big is your team managing all these as a service solutions? <sighs> Uh, all the teams I just introduced are, let's say, 50 people. The platform team itself is, I guess, 10 people uh, uh, managing the Kubernetes and Cloud Foundry infrastructure. The bit, and then we have a database team, a messaging team, a monitoring team, and a whole 50 to 60 people. OK, next one. Um, why should I have so many different clusters? <laughs> just for the sake of the demo. <laughs> Typically, I, I would not create so much different clusters, but you will have the necessity to have maybe one cluster with different shaped worker nodes, for example, because you have different requirements. Databases usually require different types of machines than web applications. Yeah, and I think also uh, if you have your monitoring on your cluster where you have your application, if your, if your cluster application goes down, how are you going to monitor it? <laughs> how do you know yeah. what's happening to it? Uh, cool. Um, how did you arrive at a pre-configured configuration that satisfies most developers? Usually, devs want something unexpected. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. That's true. Um, we identified some th sort of common subsets most of the developers really need, but we gave them the capabilities to add more if they want to. They can deploy their own operators. We don't do that namespace as a service example. We do cluster as a service example, and every developer that orders a cluster as cluster admin and can do whatever he wants with a cluster. So he can add all the necessary capabilities, but we say, OK, this is the ground stock we manage for you, and if you add something additional, you're responsible for that. You have to maintain that. You have to patch it. You have to watch for CVEs and all that stuff. So developers can do whatever they want to on top of that stack, but they are responsible for it as well. Thanks. Um, is this platform offering also suitable for migrating ex existing legacy? Um, it depends, uh, standard answer for developers. Um, yes, it is suitable for migrating legacy workload depending on the workload. We are in the process of migrating existing Java Enterprise applications to the platforms we have. Depending on if you want to modernize mainframe applications, there is not really a COBOL capable 
offering on that. Um, it depends on the type of application. Most even legacy ap enterprise applications are architected in a web application-like manner, and this can be brought to the platform as well. If you have older applications like mainframe applications, like well, even Windows applications, you can port to that platform. Um, but mainframe applications is another piece. Yeah, you need to do some uh, rejigging of the application before. Yeah, moving. you will end up in re-architecting, in rewriting different pieces of the application itself. Um, I'll choose, you can vote for the questions which are online, because I'll choose another two, three, because uh, we do have a fair amount. Uh, so, seeing your platform as a service offered to developers sounds very much like uh, following an ITIL, so IT uh, infrastructure <laughs> library uh, service yeah. model. Uh, did you purposefully have that model in mind? Well, actually, we are struggling with the ITIL model because it is not, in the version 3, it's not really compatible with the DevOps approach. Uh, we don't want to have it as a service. We think of it as a yeah, we can, you can say it's a service, but it's a product like any other product in the market, and you can, you can buy it, you can use it, and we directly talk to developers, which is not the structure ITIL service model itself. We try to find points where we con can connect our notion of a product to the ITIL service model, but that doesn't work well, so we have to deal with uh, maybe two universes to say, okay, how we can we adjust ITIL to work with our product model? Because in the end, our product model is the more successful in our company. <laughs> uh, there's no one size fits all, basically. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. Um, <laughs> interesting one. Platforms are no tools to reduce costs, are they? Uh, I imagine a manager sees the dollar amount they can reduce if you centralize ops. Yeah, you can. Yeah, maybe. It's a, it's a discussion. But if you think of developers maintaining their own applications, you have that feedback loop. That feedback loop that you get if you see what your application does when it's exposed to the customer. And that is really valuable. If you centralize operations, you will end up in cutting that feedback loop. And that will be, or that will have a big impact on how developers develop their application. That's why we think, even if it looks promising centralizing ops, we don't want to go back to that model any longer. What you can do is create services so that the ops part the developer has to do is fairly low. Like, that's why we use Cloud Foundry, for example, which is Sorry to say, not uh, Kubernetes native, but it, you can use an abstraction on Kubernetes as well, which just shrinks the functionality developers need to start the restart. You can do that if you want to. So the, the, the real benefit is not on centralizing ops, but in reducing the ops part developers have to do. So that they can focus on actually developing the application. As you saw on the slide. Um, I'll take one last question. There are a fair amount. Um, so do, if you are here on site, do connect uh, yeah. with Jurgen in person. If you are online, uh, connect with Jurgen through the application, uh, and you'll be able to send him an email or a message via the application. Uh, so the last one, which has a fair amount of votes, is how do you do the self-service part? Again, it depends. Uh, at the moment, we are starting to invest in tools like Backstage um, to create internal developer platforms, but we are right at the starting point. We used to create self-service, which are either GitOps-based or which are Kubernetes operators deployed in the customer cluster, for example, or offerings for marketplaces like Cloud Foundry has one. But we always try to think what are the tools the developers has to use and how can we integrate a marketplace-like approach into these already existing workflows. Yeah, and as you said, there are always tools coming, coming out yeah. uh, like Backstage, which are quite important. Um, thank you all. Uh, seems like it was a really interesting <laughs> and uh, um, discussed topic. Thanks again, Jürgen. Uh, thank you.